You're probably wondering why is it that there's only one banker who faced prison time or justice for the actions that caused the global financial crisis? Well, unfortunately, the answer isn't simple. There's three contributing factors that sort of just combined that resulted in such little justice being faced by the people that caused the global financial crisis. I mean, why is nothing ever simple or easy, right? Well, first up, let's talk about who actually did face prison time for financial crimes in the United States. And so between 1980 to roughly about 1990, there was a small crisis that was going on known as the savings and loans crisis. And as a result, over a thousand bankers faced prison. I mean, a thousand, that is more than the number of subscribers that I have. But now, let's fast forward to the global financial crisis. So we all know that the global financial crisis of 2007 was far worse than the savings and loans crisis in the 80s. And yet only one person faced prison. So how could this possibly be? Well first, let's talk about who this person actually is and why he faced prison time. So his name was Kareem Seragildan. And between August 2007 to August 2009, in response to the global financial crisis, he inflated the value of the portfolio that he was managing as he wanted to save face as the global financial crisis was starting to tank everything in the market. And so he committed a little bit of fraud basically just to preserve both his reputation and also his banks whilst the value of his investments were falling. Kareem was sentenced to 30 months in prison and he was legitimately remorseful. And even the judge sympathised with him. <clears throat> he is just a small part of an overall evil climate that exists within his bank and also many other banks. And it is very reasonable to suspect that Kareem Sarah Gildan was not the only person committing fraud within Credit Suisse at the time, let alone the other banks. In fact, after the fraud had come to light, Credit Suisse wrote down the net worth of their entire bank, and they wrote it down by $2.65 billion. But out of that $2.65 billion after that fraud had been revealed, only $100 million of that was because of Kareem Sarah Gildan. And so by my calculations, Karim was only responsible for about 3.7% of that write down because of the fraud. So where's the other 96.3%? And, and to be fair, there were two other bankers that were found to be guilty from Credit Suisse at the time. And they were David Higgs and Selman Sidiquoy. And both of them instantly pleaded guilty and cooperated with investigators. And although they had a guilty verdict, they did not have to face any time in prison, unlike Kareem. And so technically speaking, there were three bankers who faced justice out of Credit Suisse, even though only one faced prison time. And okay, so out of the roughly 50 financial institutions in the United States, and out of all the billions of dollars of fraud that was going on at the time, how is it that only three people faced prosecutorial act... Prosecut... Pros prosecutorial action as a response to the crisis? Well, there's three reasons. And the first reason is that banks have become woke. And I'm not talking about woke in the sense of political correctness, I'm talking about woke in the sense of legal compliance. Many bankers avoided jail because they make it part of their daily routine to check in with the legal compliance departments of their banks. And the reason to do this is to make sure that they're always operating within sight of a letter of a law, even though they may be going very far outside of the intention or the spirit of those laws. And so it's very hard to prosecute if they have technically met all the legal requirements, even though they're clearly acting in bad faith. Reason number two, the Holder Doctrine. So in 1999, a memorandum was written by the Deputy Attorney General warning of the danger of prosecuting big banks. So he asserts that the collateral consequences of prosecuting a large bank could include instability and collapse or for the entire economy, and it could also affect innocent parties. This memo is echoed by Lenny Brenner, who was the head of the Justice Department's Criminal Division, where they stated that they have to consider the health of the company and the industry and the markets before deciding on whether they should or should not prosecute. So what does this mean in English? Well, well let's just pretend that there is XYZ Bank and they had some criminal fraudsters who are running the entire show. And let's just say that they were prosecuted and sent away to prison. But unfortunately, the risk here is that this could then bankrupt the bank. And you may be thinking, well, so what, right? But what about the innocent depositors who have put all their life savings in there and had no idea that this criminal behavior was going on? And what about the people who have a mortgage of that bank who had no idea about any of this behavior? Should they be punished? 
And if that bank were to go under, it could cause a domino effect which affects other banks that were doing nothing wrong as well. And so it could damage the entire United States economy. And so is it right that so many innocent parties have to be punished because of somebody else's justice? So I can see the logic behind this and whether it's executed correctly or not, well, that's a very complicated debate. But this was the way of thinking at the time for the justice departments. And it is a very similar argument to what we so commonly heard with the bailouts after the global financial crisis with the too big to fail. So a very similar way of thinking. But with that being said, you'd say, okay, but that would only prevent very high level prosecutions. What about prosecutions against lower and mid-level executives? You're right, there was nothing stopping that. And in 2009, the US attorney for the Eastern District of New York tried two Bear Stearns hedge fund managers. That was Ralph Coffey and Matthew Tennant. And through a combination of acts, including criminal fraud, they ran a $1.6 billion hedge fund into the ground. And this happened in early 2007, and it was the first major collapse. Oh. oh, Spencer's barking at an ambulance. And this was the first collapse of the global financial crisis and the first domino to fall, which, as we all know, knocked over other dominoes and caused the whole series of events that basically devastated the world. So anyway, the US Attorney Generals took them to a criminal court and unfortunately, a jury acquitted them. Anyway, going back to the Holder Doctrine, this restricted many prosecutions until about four years after the global financial crisis in 2012, as it was only then that it was deemed that the banks were stable enough to be able to withstand the massive legal punches that are about to be thrown in their direction. brings us to reason number three for why there is very little justice after the global financial crisis for the people who caused the global financial crisis. The statute of limitations. What a statute of limitations means is that with certain crimes, there is a time limit for when you can be charged for that crime after the crime was done. And in the case of criminal fraud in the United States, it is a five-year statute of limitations. So as I mentioned before with the Holder Doctrine, they had to hold back for about four years before they could actually charge any of these banks. And you think, okay, but that's fine. They still have one good year where they can still make these charges. But unfortunately, the majority of the crimes that caused the global financial crisis weren't done at the financial crisis. They were done before it. And so for the majority of these crimes that they wanted to prosecute, the statute of limitations for criminal charges had already passed. But it wasn't all doom and gloom because although they'd passed it for the criminal court, the civil court statute of limitations was actually 10 years. And if you're wondering what the difference between a criminal court and a civil court is, just think of a criminal court as where you could be potentially sent to prison and it's because you've broken laws against the country or the state. Whereas in a civil court, that's more people suing one another. So with that being said, I can now talk about the civil court system and then talk about the justice that actually was successfully delivered to the banks who are committing this high levels of fraud. And so Holder gave all of his US attorneys from all over the country permission to go after the fraudster banks. He gave them both the responsibility and the freedom to just to charge away now that the US economy was now stable enough to take these hits, whether it be done through the criminal system or even the civil system. And a team led by Ben Wagner, who was the US attorney of the Eastern District of California, had a breakthrough when he was going after JP Morgan Chase. So a team drafted out but not filed a 2013 insider complaint from JP Morgan Chase from one of their former employees. This 13 page complaint detailed about how JP Morgan Chase purposely were putting in bad mortgages that did not meet their own credit standards into investments and then selling them on as investments to unsuspecting investors. So US Attorney Wagner disposed Elaine Fleischman who was a former JP Morgan Chase banker and whistleblower and had warned her former management about the dangerous practices that they're doing. Now, after she highlighted these concerns, did JP Morgan give her a promotion and say, oh, that's very well spotted and yeah, we should address this. <laughs> no, they fired her. So in November 2013, the Justice Department threatened to make this 13 page insider complaint public knowledge. They threatened to release the entire document which would name and shame all the parties involved with JP Morgan Chase. And in order to prevent this public shaming and also to give the Justice Department that bit of a pound of flesh for the bad behaviors that they were doing, they agreed to pay a $13 billion settlement fee between both federal and state enforcement agencies. So that sounds great, right? Yes, but this is until you consider that the money was being paid by the bank itself and not the individuals that are doing the bad behaviors. And so it was actually the shareholders who were having to pay for these fines. 
And what's also a little bit depressing about this as well is that they can claim some of these settlement costs as a business expense and then hence reduce their future tax bill for the coming year. But it is still one of the biggest wins that a Justice Department had against a major bank. And therefore, a similar playbook was used by Justice Departments from other states around the United States in order to go after the big banks who had committed these crimes. So that playbook being basically to threaten the public release of information that outlines what behaviours these banksters were doing. But again, it's frustrating that no individual is held accountable, but still some justice is better than no justice. So now that the Justice Departments have a playbook to use, they basically just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And when all was said and done, since 2009, 49 American financial institutions paid $190 billion in fines and settlements. And this is according to an analysis by investment bank Keith Burnett and Woods. So it sounds like a very significant figure until the Google how much money was actually lost during the global financial crisis. And that is roughly about half a trillion dollars or 500 billion. And so they paid 190 billion in fines of punishment, but they did about 500 billion dollars worth of damage. And so from the way I look at it, we're about 310 billion dollars short of proper justice. And so the banks did get off pretty lightly. And it isn't just me that thinks this, the banks themselves actually think got off lightly as well. And they never publicly said this, but their behavior kind of says this. And this is how. Jamie Dimon, who was the CEO of, of JP Morgan Chase, settled out of court with the Justice Department. And a week later, after he settled out of court, his board of directors gave him a 74% pay increase to $20 million per year. And so, why would you give someone such a drastic pay raise a week after they performed a major event, and, unless you felt as though they had performed a miracle for you? Anyway, before we know it, we'd passed the 10-year mark of the civil court's statute of limitations. And so we've now reached a point that any justice that could be served has now been served and anyone who got in the way of it is going to permanently get away of it. And also, we can't be angry at all of the prosecutorial authorities. I mean, they put in a real significant effort to try and get justice. But unfortunately, the bankers have just gotten too smart now to make sure that they're legally compliant to the letter of the law, even though it's not within the spirit of the law. And so unfortunately, I am ending this video in a little bit of a depressing note. But to counter that, next week I'll be doing a very uplifting video. I'll be talking about how 35 countries around the world are coming together to invest in the world's most expensive science experiment.